So we are on here and this is uh, the chapter on capital budgeting. So in this chapter, the basics of capital budgeting, evaluating cash flows. We're going to do basically the overview and vocabulary of capital budgeting, which is linked to the chapter on cost of capital, because the output of that chapter, which is basically the WACC, is a critical input into uh, capital budgeting techniques. There are three major capital budgeting techniques, methods, the payback, discounted payback method, which is a, a, a very old and a very elementary way of uh, calculating, uh, you know, whether a project is desirable or not. And uh, something, you know, you can actually um, look in the book is basically based on time. And net present value and IRR and MIRR, modified internal rate of return, internal rate of return, and NPV. And uh, these are such important and basic concepts in corporate finance that uh, one simple way I can illustrate how important they are is you literally have two buttons for that here, NPV and IRR. And we have not used that, and I'll show you how to use that. No big deal. The chapter appears to be a little bit, um, you know, numerical and all that, but uh, that actually makes it easy, I think. Targeted homework, you have these slides, no need to spend precious time on it. It's, um, in case you don't know, it's 100 megabytes per minute. Recording on screen flow. What is capital budgeting? It's an analysis of potential projects. Long-term decisions have to be made. Capital budgeting is basically about long-term decisions, by the way. And I know some of you already work for large corporations or just corporations. They don't have to be large. And those decisions, you know, uh, they involve large expenditures, and they're typically about uh, uh, the distant uh, future. And it's uh, obviously very important. <clears throat> what type of capital expenditures are generally there to be seen? Expansion or acquiring new fixed assets, so, so, uh, such as a new water filtration plant. So, you know, in the town of Orno, you know, you, you, you'll have that on the ballot. People will vote whether they want a new water filtration plant or not. Replacement of obsolete or worn out assets. So you can go to a company and they can have the old style CRT, cathode ray tube type monitors, and they work fine. But then maybe that's not the image they want to give to their new clients. And so they're, they're making a decision whether to replace it with flat panel screens or not. So that's a decision, even though the old monitors work. Renewal of existing assets, such as overhauling aircraft. As you know, or maybe you have thought about it or not, but that decision can literally impact um, safety of passengers. Uh, maybe the reason why U.S. airlines are still amongst the safest in the world because, you know, we replace uh, the, the parts on an aircraft uh, sooner than some other countries or airlines are able to do. And some other capital expenditures, such as advertising, R&D, pollution control, hard to categorize, but you know. So these are but some of the big capital expenditures that can be incurred by a corporation. So what are some of the steps? You estimate the cash flows, both inflows and outflows. You assess the risk of cash flows. <clears throat> See, this riskiness of cash flows, this is where finance hits accounting, you know. Um, and uh, this, the, this is the volatility that by now you are reasonably familiar with it. And then you determine R, which is the WACC for the project. So by now you know that it's not just the cost of equity or cost of debt or cost of preferred stock, but you got to look at things like retained earnings and then the weight of each of those components into your entire capital structure and uh, then determine R. And eventually <clears throat> evaluate those cash flows and in fact, you know, um, even have an idea of the yield curve so that you can factor in the current discount rate and you evaluate the cash flows, um, the present value of those cash flows, you know. <clears throat> this is where management comes. So it's all linked, you know. So one should not, I mean, we like to classify things. We like to classify everything, you know. Uh, but I think, you know, 
um, in, in business, you know, whether it's management, marketing, accounting, finance, they're all integrated. And for successful business, they all are. Statistics, operations, research, and then all the science, the engineering, the math, it's all linked. And so, you, you, so some people will, will, will generate a proposal. They're like, all right, we should have a new assembly line here and a new way to move things around the shop floor. Well, should we have a, a conveyor belt procedure or system or should we have forklifts, you know? And then there'll be two groups in that company. They're going to fight with each other. There'll be a lot of uh, meetings in a meeting room and donuts and coffee, I guess. <clears throat> right? And they won't come to a, an agreement. So there'll be review and analysis. Then other people will be brought in to break up that fight, right? Uh, well, that's, I guess, that, and then they won't be able to break up that fight, so decision-making will happen. And then some people, you know, who can bang the table a little louder, they're going to make a decision, where, even if it's suboptimal. And then uh, some specific people will be called up, and they're going to implement it. So whether we're going to have a system of conveyor belts to move the boxes at the new warehouse for Amazon, or we're going to have some forklifts, you know, to do that. They're going to build it or buy it. And then this is where the management geniuses will come in and they'll follow up on that whether the whole thing worked or not. A series of interviews, more coffee and more donuts. Right? So to uh, get into capital budgeting, uh, there's, uh, there's an important difference that I want to just mention. It's the difference between independent projects and, ex and mutually exclusive projects. So independent projects are if the cash flows of one are unaffected by the acceptance of the other. Mutually exclusive, if the cash flows of one project can be adversely impacted by the acceptance of the other. So let's say, you know, um, um, let's say, thinking here on live. How many Walmarts are there? in the greater Bangor region? In greater Bangor? Two. Or how, how many? <coughs> if you count Ellsworth, that's three. I didn't think about that. But there's definitely one in Brewer, right? The Brewer one still works, yeah? And there's, a, there's, there's one in, uh, in Bangor. And even that one moved, right? It, 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 I mean, for those of you who've lived here long enough, it, it used to be in a different place. <coughs> What about Sam's? You think Sam's, Sam's is also part of the whole uh, Walmart operations, right? I would think so, you know, right? Sam's, Walmart. So think about it. I mean, we have Greater Bangor region, you know, that uh, serves, you know, uh, maybe 30,000 people, maybe 70,000 people, depending how you count. And you got two, if not three, and maybe even four, maybe one in Ellsworth. <clears throat> so anyway, what is the story there? So if suppose the... The request or the decision, the request is for a new warehouse. A warehouse in Augusta. How about we put one in Augusta? So should we have a warehouse in Augusta or another warehouse in, uh, in Brewer? And then somebody would say that it seems like they're mutually exclusive. You can have one or the other. How about one in Augusta and one in Austin, Texas? I would say those warehouses are reasonably independent, you know. Uh, so they serve, they have, they have, they're so geographically uh, uh, separated out that, that the cash flows and the business activity coming out of one are unaffected by the acceptance of the other. So Walmart management will say, well, if you want, you can have either one, one in Brewer or one in Augusta, but we can't afford to give you one in both. So that would be mutually exclusive. And then there'll be, as you can imagine, there'll be a lot of discussion, right? And eventually politics is going to come in if Walmart is going to build a new warehouse, whether it's going to be in Augusta or in, uh, in Brewer. And the politics will probably intensify even more if the decision is you can have one additional warehouse in Portland versus one in, in New Hampshire, you know, or something like that, Portsmouth. So then it will become more inten intensive. So we're going to come back to this because this is going to be throughout. So it's very important that, you know, when a project, basically what we, we are, we are going to find, we're going to discuss techniques on how to accept or reject the proposal for a new project. So, of course, first thing is whether it's mutually exclusive or it's independent. If it's mutually exclusive, then it's a tougher decision, basically. 
<clears throat> One simple method is payback method. It provides an indication of a project's risk and liquidity, reasonably easy to calculate and understand. And so it's basically, let's say, uh, you know, I want to borrow a thousand bucks and uh, I come to you and your simple question is that, you know, when will you be able to return it back to me? When will you be able to pay it back to me? And uh, so I say six months. And, and then someone else comes to you and asks for a thousand bucks and they say that it's going to be 18 months. So you just say that, well, I'll give it to Pank. The risk profile is about the same. I just want my money back faster. So that's the payback method. And the unit is, there. The unit is time. And it indicates a project's risk and liquidity. <clears throat> But what is actually done in corporate finance, see, see there, you know, there was, it ignored the time value of money uh, and it ignored the cash flows occurring after the payback period, if you actually think about that. Because um, if you invested in a project and the project generated you a thousand bucks and you got it, but because the, the project, let's say in this case a restaurant, it continues to do well and it generates 5,000 bucks, the next year, you are not factoring that in. You just want to look at how, how quickly you get your money back. So net present value is the first of these uh, two capital budgeting techniques that we're going to address in this chapter. And once again, I really want to mention to you that there's nothing really new in this equation. This equation we've been working with throughout in this class, and it's basically the present value of all future cash flows. So R is your discount rate, CF are your cash flows, and T is the time over which those cash flows are going to occur. <clears throat> Except that instead of PV, now we have NPV. Now notice there's a PV button here, and so and there's an NPV above that. So what is the difference? The difference is this CF0. CF stands for cash flow, and by now you know the subscript 0 means time, it indicates time, zero. Time zero means round. So CF zero is just another, another way to think of your investment, which is your cash outflow. So if you invest in a restaurant, uh, at the end of every day, you get some cash, and that's your cash inflow. Uh, but to start that restaurant, you have to buy the plates, the air conditioning, the chairs, and all that. And so... You're going to do the present value of those future cash inflows, but let's not forget that was a big outflow too, you know. And then you can make it more interesting. I mean, every day uh, the, the inflow is hopefully a positive inflow because there's variable cost, right? I mean, the biggest cost of a restaurant, uh, what do you think? I don't know. What is the biggest cost of a restaurant? Is it the, uh, the, the, the food items or is it the wages to it? The liquor license. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking about liquidity all the time. I like that. Huh? <laughs> liquidity. Actually, my, my, my glass here says liquid net. Liquid. Yeah, it is about liquidity. Do you need to check that? <laughs> <laughs> I got carded the other day. I was very happy about that. I really did. Yeah, it was probably because of the people I went out with, you know. They were all youngsters, you know. <laughs> I said, I need to hang out with you guys more often. I get carded more often. It's good for me. I also was wearing a hat, you know, a Nautica hat, yeah. So, what was the answer to the restaurant question? Probably wages. Wages? Yeah. You I mean, think so? Really? Yeah. Really? Wow. So, it would just be the cooks and management and line workers. Yeah. Or they'd be probably definitely up there. Wages and, let's say, the variable costs, you know, coming out of the... F the raw items. Well, it depends, yeah. yeah. If you're starting like a, a restaurant, you have to buy all the capital. Yeah. Yeah, that's the fixed cost. That, that's the fixed cost. So there's like AFC, the average fixed cost, AVC, the average variable cost, and the two of them, when you add them up, it becomes ATC. That's, I'm, I'm actually remembering microeconomics from 1986 just now. <laughs> that's ATC average total. Do you remember that curve, you know? ATC, the average total cost, you know? Yeah. It's amazing. <coughs> But anyway, guys, here, uh, what we have is, so I, I, I like to, sim as you know, I like to simplify things. S simple is actually difficult, you know. Yes, no is a simple answer, and so often you don't get that. You get an entire paragraph, and you're like, oh, what was that? Is that a yes or no? You want to do it? You don't want to do it. 
But anyway, the simplification here is this. Net present value is basically the present value of your inflows minus the present value of your outflows. Just that. That's the basic concept behind it. And why, why, there's nothing wrong about it. It makes sense. If you want to ramp up the jargon a little bit, the present value of inflows is the present value of, the, of your revenue stream minus the present value of your, the costs that you incurred. You want to ramp it up a little bit more is the present value of your future cash flows, that's your revenue, minus I naught, which is today's investment. So this equation here, you can actually expand it to this, and your careful eyes are going to notice that I very, very mildly have changed this t equals 0 to t equals 1. At t equals 0, 1 plus r to the power t, you know, so anything raised to the power 0 is 1, so that's your CF0. So I, I took the first element out because that is the interesting item in the sense that is your initial investment. So these are all hopefully positive numbers. You have your restaurant, and hopefully every day you have a net, net positive cash flow. And there was a lump sum big cash outflow at the very beginning. Of course, you can initially you know, not disagree, but you can think about it. That, well, you know, we have to repair things and all that. But that's all just modification to the basic formula. It can all be done on the fly with... Uh, or modern computing uh, software and all that. No problems there. All right, so that's your net present value, guys. So you take the present value of your future cash flows minus the initial investment. That's it. So now we, let's work with two projects, L and S. We're going to work with them throughout this chapter. <clears throat> so project S, you invest 100 bucks and it generates $10, $10 $60, $80 and $80 at the end of the first, second, and third year. Project S is quite different. Most of the cash flows occur very quickly, uh, close to the initial investment, and then they taper off. There are actually projects like that, you know, like, you know, fashion projects probably, you know. Uh, like the first one could be like a nuclear power plant, you know, where initially there's a long gestation period, and then it starts generating and breaking even, you know, as it goes further. But if you think of, let's say, a, a, a project that produces uh, something fantastic like, uh, like the Furby. <laughs> Nobody knows what a Furby is. I just... They're making a comeback, so we have to modify that timeline, you know? So that was kind of like one of those. One of those, yeah. So Furby, you know, there's a lot of excitement about it, or let's say Ninja Turtles, something, and they generate... <laughs> Cash flow, cash flow here, and then it tapers off. <laughs> so what is Enterprise L's NPV or Franchise L's NPV, whatever you want to call it? Well, see, first the basics here. The basics are, they, they are actually the same or similar, the same that you see in DCF, dividend discount model or time value of money, but there's always a little difference, and there should be, otherwise it's repetition. Minus 100 bucks investment, 10% is the opportunity cost of capital or the market discount rate, or basically, you know, your, your cost of borrowing. And in fact, I can let the cat out of the bag, that's your cost of capital for this particular project. You don't, it doesn't matter what the Fed discount rate or the Fed target rate is or the credit card rate is, this is your cost of capital. So you can, you can borrow this 100 bucks at 10%. And then it generates 10, 60, and 80, now this 10 divided by 1.1, you get 909. This 60 divided by 1.1 squared, you get this. And uh, if you add them all up, now notice this time we are adding the minus 100 as well. Because otherwise this would be like nice, right? This is like just getting, just getting a positive cash flow all the time, you know? Yeah, free lunch, exactly. Uh, no, but you invested 100 and... The elegance, beauty, and power of this NPV budgeting technique is right away it tells you, today, today it's telling you that your current wealth is going to go up by $18.79 if you invest $100 in this project. And a lot of companies are also valued like that, but as you can imagine, not a mistakes, I don't want to say mistakes, mistakes means like deliberate. Uh, 
things may not pan out exactly, right? Because you're making a f forecast of your cash flow three years out and, and also of your discount rate. Homework for you, just see if NPVS is $19.98. Um, all you have to do is go back and replace 10, 16, 80 with 70, 50, and 20, and you would get that. Now, these cash flows can become long and uh, repetitive, so we have to do something different. <clears throat> I have to show you a calculator solution. How do you use the NPV functionality that's built in your calculator? So let's do this here. So first we populate the cash flow field here. So hit CF and you see enter, up, down, and $100 with a negative sign. Now not this negative, but this negative here. And do not forget to hit the enter button, which is here. And minus, minus 100 uh, is stored in... Um, in the memory of your calculator. Hit the down arrow button here, and that's C01. Here is C01, we call it CF1 here, same thing. It's your first cash flow. <clears throat> or if you want to think of it as a second cash flow, but just make sure you differentiate it because all C1, C2, C3 are very different from the first one, um, which was the initial investment. And that's $10. You do 10, hit enter. Now I actually get something called F, and, and this is a very valuable function here. F is the frequency, which is basically the number of times that particular cash flow happens. And when you do the homework, there may be a situation where um, it, it would say that, and, and $10,000 for the next five years. So you can just do five there, and so that'll save you from entering 10,000 five times as C2, C3, C4, C5. So that's just your frequency there. But the default is one, that means it happens once. C02, that's 60 bucks. So you enter 60 here. Hit enter. F021. And C3 is 80. Oops. This is the back arrow here. Backspace. Hit enter. And C3 is 80. Hit enter, F1, continue enter there. Uh, C4 is zero, there's no cash flow of zero, and uh, don't enter zero, don't, don't hit enter there, and, and see F04 by default will come as zero, that means there's zero occurrences of zero dollars, because that would be a valid entry, and we don't want to do that. Now continue hitting the down arrow button, <clears throat> And that'll be a nice cross check. It's always important to cross check in these kind of, whenever you're using technology. Garbage in, garbage out. Minus 100, 10. You know, we pay attention to the sign here. 60, 80, and just that, all right? You can clear the screen here. And so that information is stored under your cash flow button here, the cash flow field. Now hit the NPV button here. And let's just familiarize ourselves with it. What does this have? I is probably interest rate, or probably interest rate, P spelled P-R-O-L-L-Y teaching wrong things in class. <laughs> Mr. Dorothy, don't do that, okay? I know you don't, that's why. I think everybody else does that. Somewhere. NPV, um, NPV is, see, the compute option comes there. So that's what we're shooting for here. And I, so just that, I and NPV. So now we need to, to discount, think of those cash flows, we need to give it the discount rate. We did a whole chapter for that I. In this case, I is a cost of capital. That's 10%. Hit 10. Hit enter. Now, now. now your only option is to compute it. $18.78. Just be careful, guys, sometimes, you know, that 1878 doesn't have the dollar sign there. NPV, the unit is dollars. IRR, the unit is percentages. Payback, the unit is time. So there are three different non-overlapping cost of budgeting techniques, and uh, the output is a different unit in all three of them. So the NPV is $18.78. We nice homework to do to see what the NPV uh, is of project S. 
So basically, NPV is uh, the net gain in wealth. Present value of inflows minus the cost. So your decision criteria for a project is, except the project is NPV is greater than zero. As simple as that. That's your decision criteria. We're not comparing it to the interest rate. We're not comparing it to the cost of capital. As long as your project is, uh, uh, you accept the project if NPV is greater than zero. Now for some of you out there working on million, billion dollar projects, uh, you can start haggling about this. But then it's just a, a question of determining what your uh, benchmarks are. Because you could say that if suppose you have a $500 million project and it generates uh, $50,000, that's a positive NPV, right? Would you invest in that? Probably not. Choose between mutually exclusive projects on basis of higher NPV. Now this is an interesting one. So suppose we calculate the NPV of the Augusta Warehouse as $1.5 million and that of Brewer as $1 million. So both of them are positive NPV, but that's why the discussion on the mutually exclusive ones are. So we will take the Augusta one because it meets two criteria now. The NPV is positive and the NPV is higher. So using NPV method, which franchise should be accepted? If franchise S and L are mutually exclusive, accept S because NPV S is greater than NPV L. This is just a translation of what I just said. If S and L are independent, accept both because the NPV is greater than zero. But like I said, scale becomes an issue. And I may mention it later on, but you know, there's, so that's why you know, there's no simple answer. You know? So this is like simplifying something. But then, if you think about scale, uh, obviously, uh, you have to look at, you know, what the size is, relative size is. So I got one minute. Pros and cons of NPV. It considers time value of money, obviously, because we, we plugged in the interest rate. Considers all cash flows and shows increase in shareholder wealth from projects. The problem is the discount rate is not readily available. Is what is the cost of capital for the firm? As you know, you have to do a lot of calculations to get there. And hence, we get into the next topic on capital budgeting, the internal rate of return, which does not have some of these limitations, but as you well know, there's no free lunch. It has some other problems. And that we will discuss next time.